Hi, everyone, and welcome to Improving User Experience with Analytics. I'm Lauren Beaumont. And I'm Tracy McCarthy. We will kick things off today by talking about what UX actually is. Next, we will give you some tools to determine if your website is meeting users' expectations or not. We will also look at whether or not your site is meeting your own expectations. And lastly, we will measure, optimize, and repeat. So what is UX? Simply put, user experience, or UX, is how you feel about every interaction you have with what's in front of you in the moment, uh, whether that's a product, system, or service. We're here to talk about user experience in relation to your website, but because user experience includes all the interactions someone has with your organization, I wanted to talk briefly about your brand. Building a strong brand is about building rapport with people. That doesn't just happen in person with a provider or your medical staff. It's a journey that starts with your patient's first introduction to your organization. You start building a relationship with your community members the minute they encounter a representation of your brand, whether that's a billboard, TV ad, or your website. But your brand isn't just who or what you say you are. You can say whatever you want about your organization. But if what you say isn't reinforced by what you do, your brand values will ring false. And that's because your brand is also what people think you are because of the experiences you create with them. In the end, it's really about the emotional experience we build with our core audience. And that emotional experience can take on many forms. It can be anything from heartfelt gratitude for saving someone's life to a sense of reassurance that someone can trust you to provide them with the information they need when it's important. Anything that disrupts the user experience breaks trust. Sure, it's not the same kind of trust as not providing great patient care when needed. One is definitely more impactful than the other. But multiple disruptions at a minor level, such as not finding what you need on a website, can eventually lead to bad feelings overall. Obviously, there are lots of elements to a website strategy, but we're going to focus on just a few important and measurable ones. So what do users want? 76% of users say the most important factor of a website is being able to easily find what they're looking for. While a beautiful appearance or a cutting edge interactive experience are important, it's, if users can't find what they're looking for, they're going to take the path of least resistance. And that path may lead them to another website. Knowing, what users, knowing that users just want their experience to be easy, it's important to take an honest look at your site and ask, is my website meeting users' expectations? Of course, when you design your site, you're thinking, of course, this is intuitive. A lot of times city planners feel that way when they design sidewalks. Oftentimes, expectation and reality are two very different things. The concept of a desire path is something we've talked about before here at Geonetric, but I think it's important to reiterate this concept. A desire path is a path that the user takes regardless of what path was intended. It's often hard to predict how a user is going to interact with your site, so it's really important to continually evaluate these desire paths. Unfortunately, websites are kind of like pets. They can't always tell us what's wrong, but at least websites don't ever have to wear the cone of shame. Because it isn't always immediately apparent if there's a problem, it usually takes a little digging to discover these desire paths. This is why we continually look at data and behavior patterns to identify if there's a problem and then evaluate ways to remedy this problem. Given that user behavior and expectations are constantly shifting, it's important to continue this process so that you can adapt with your audience. So now that we know that it is important to adapt to our user, what are some tools you have at your fingertips to determine if your website is meeting users' expectations? Spoiler alert, a lot of these live in Google Analytics. The most basic and most immediate indicator of user experience is bounce rate. Bounce rate is a percentage of visitors who come to your landing page and leave without engaging with any elements on the page or clicking through to another page. They either got to your site and said nope, uh, or they found what they were looking for on the entrance page and left satisfied with their visit. That one metric can have very different goals attached to it. So it's important to analyze the purpose of the page before panicking or looking for ways to fix it. So what is the purpose of the page? Location and provider profile pages, for example, typically have higher bounce rates than service line pages because users often visit those pages with a specific purpose in mind. Uh, for example, an address or a phone number. 
Assuming the page includes the information they were looking for, the user may bounce satis satisfied with their visit, and that's a win. But what if users entered your site on a page that included a conversion opportunity or the main page of a service line that typically directs users deeper into your site? If a higher number of users entered on one of these pages and left before completing an expected action, you'd want to investigate why. A couple of those reasons could include slow, low, slow page load or page relevancy. A recent study showed that 53% of mobile users will wait no more than three seconds for a page to load before abandoning a site. Uh, with more and more users searching using a mobile device, that's a high bounce rate in a short amount of time. Checking your page load times and, and taking action where possible. Uh, limit the size and number of images on a page, check fonts and scripts used. If you can decrease your page load times, not only will you decrease your bounce rate, but you'll ultimately see improvements in your organic traffic through improved search rankings. If it's not a page load issue, check page relevancy. Are users seeing something unexpected or unrelated to what they came for? If so, adjust the page title and description accordingly. Optimize the content on your page and make sure your message is targeting the right audience. So let's assume the page title and meta descriptions are targeting the right audience. The page loads super fast and is packed with relevant content, yet bounce rate is higher than you'd expect. Users should be navigating to the next page in the funnel or they should be completing an expected call to action, but they're not. If that's the case, it's time to look at the visual design and grammatical style of your page. Is something off-putting? Again, your brand is what people think you are because of the experiences you create with them. If a user's initial impression of you is bad spelling, poor grammar, or a visually off-putting web page, how do you think they'll feel about entrusting their healthcare to you? Finally, take a look at your navigation. If a user isn't sure where or how to proceed, they're likely not going to spend much time searching. Make sure your page includes easy to scan headlines and subheads. Include relevant subtopics and links to draw users deeper into the service line pages. And make sure all your pages include a clear call to action leading users down the path you want them to take. So to recap, bounce rates still matter a lot. They, they lead us down an investigative path to find and fix problems. First, determine which pages shouldn't have high bounce rates. Monitor those pages for sudden or gradual bounce rate changes. And when you see a problem, run through the list of potential causes and adjust accordingly. Review your page load times. Check page relevancy against the messaging you're using to target users. Uh, review the page for visual and grammatical style and review the navigation on the, on the page, making sure there's a clear next step for users. Whether you're noticing a decrease in page views and sessions or an increase in bounce rate, one of the first places to start looking is your channels report in Google Analytics. This report can help answer some very important questions. Does my website make sense to search engines? Are my campaigns directing people to the pages they would expect? Are my campaign landing pages effective? Does my page contain user-friendly and relevant content? How can channels help identify if there's a problem? Channels is one of the most common places where we will say, it depends. I know this is everyone's favorite answer, but it's so true. When looking at channels, it's really useful to look at context first. If you see any irregularities in traffic or bounce rate for specific channels, you'll want to take into consideration things like what page users are landing on and what device they are using. For example, you notice that social has a particularly high bounce rate. If they are bouncing on something like a patient story, this could absolutely make sense, as users most likely read the story they were interested in and then left. However, if they landed on a page where they are not completing that desired action, that might be an indicator that it's time to reevaluate your CTA. Device type can also be a really useful dimension to look at in conjunction with channels. Users on mobile devices tend to be a bit more intent driven, so if a mobile user bounces from something like a location page, we aren't so worried about that. However, if there is a video, content, or other strong CTA that users are not engaging with, it's worth asking why. Here's a real world example. Whenever I see a major fluctuation in traffic, the first thing I do is take a look at what channels contributed to that increase or decrease. In this example, a site had gone through a lot of restructuring and consolidating of content. 
so initially the decrease in page views was not alarming at all. However, when page views continued to drop and the affected channel continued to be organic search, we knew it was time to reevaluate the pages themselves. Often these decreases can be due to something like a campaign or event that had occurred the previous year, but in this case, the decreases from organic search signified that we were not meeting the user's expectations. Similarly, whenever I see an unusually high bounce rate or a major change in bounce rate, I always take a look at the channels first. In this example, the overall site bounce rate was a little high compared to the peer group. Looking specifically at organic search, that bounce rate was much higher than I would typically expect. Additionally, it had increased by quite a bit year over year. Looking at the device types, we noticed that mobile had a much higher bounce rate than desktop for organic search users. Our next step was to look at the landing pages those mobile organic users were landing on to see if there was one page in particular that was providing a negative experience or if it was just the mobile site as a whole. We identified the weight management page as being the culprit. In this case, a video on the weight management page that was not rendering correctly on mobile, which not only pushed all the CTAs to the bottom of the page, but it also just looked unprofessional, breaking the user's trust. This is one of those instances where channels, in conjunction with other useful metrics, helped pinpoint a UX problem. In summary, Monitor your channel traffic and engagement regularly to see if there are any irregularities. Determine if any major fluctuations in traffic or bounce rate make sense. Dig in to investigate and fix any potential problems. Site Search is another great Google Analytics tool to identify potential issues. There are a few types of Site Search users to consider. Type number one, employees. They tend to be looking for a lot of human resources information or links to log on to their email. Type number two, what I call power users, who will search for something even if the button is directly next to the search box. And type number three, who we really want to focus on, are lifeline users. These users are truly using search as a last ditch effort to find this information because they are unable to find it easily. Let's take a look at what data we have available that can help those Lifeline users before they give up and find the information they need somewhere else. First up, the search terms report. This can help you answer questions like, what are the terms uh, people are searching for? Are there highly searched terms that you might consider adding to your navigation or to your A to Z services search? Also, take a look at the percent search exits. This is the percentage of people that exit the site without clicking through to one of the search results. A high percentage here would indicate that users may not have found what they were looking for even after searching. Do you have the information somewhere on your site? If not, would this be valuable to your users? You can also add a secondary dimension for a device category. This will highlight if there are certain things that are more difficult to find on mobile versus desktop. If users are searching more heavily on mobile or searching for a specific term more heavily on mobile, this could indicate a negative user experience on mobile. Another useful report to look at is the search pages report. Was a user on a service line page when they searched for a related medical term or a physician? What are users not getting from that page and how can we get it to them without making them search for it? This report can help answer these questions. It tells you what page the user was on when they initiated their search. You can also drill down into these start pages to see what search terms were used. This gives really fantastic insight into what information users are looking for in various stages of their journey. To recap, when looking at site search, you'll want to look at top terms users searched for, pay attention to the percentage of search exits, look at top pages users are searching from, create any content that doesn't already exist, and optimize your site for content that is hard to find. One of my favorite things to do is to look at user paths, where we truly see our users' desire paths come to life. This is often where design and user experience diverge, so it's very important to focus on what the user wants and think about how we can give that to them in the most efficient way. Looking at this user path, we notice a bit of a problem. We have a user that lands on the heart service line page. Right off the bat, 61% of people exit from this page. Rather than digging into additional heart content, we see that the third most common next page takes them back to the home page and the fourth most common next page takes them to site search. 
this is a strong indicator that users are not finding what they're looking for. On the flip side, here's an example of a healthy user path. Here we see users that start on the Women's Health main service line page and easily drill down into the specific area they're looking for and ultimately exit from either a location or a provider page. Studying user paths helps us make the connection between what we design for and what users do. We should always strive to adapt our sites to make their journey easier. In this photo, we can see how Michigan State University took a look at those beautiful pedestrian desire paths and ended up paving them, making this user-friendly network of paths. So you pulled in users and you made sure they're happy, but what about you? Are your goals and expectations being met? You can monitor your goals by setting up and tracking events on your site. Not events in the sense of different gatherings your organization offers that people can attend, but rather different actions on your website that users can take. Things like creating an online MyChart or patient account, clickable phone numbers, requesting an appointment, registering for a class, or finding a doctor's service or location. You've prioritized certain elements on your site and given them prime real estate in your navigation. Are, are people using these tools? Adding event tracking to these elements can answer that. You've invested time and resources in creating video content. Is certain content being viewed more often than others? Are users viewing videos from start to finish or do they lose interest at a certain point? And are they sharing the content they viewed? Event tracking can, ask, can answer those questions as well. Conversion opportunities are important to user engagement and ultimately your organization's end goals. Make sure you're keeping an eye on those opportunities by tracking user engagement on the elements you want users to interact with. Test different links in your navigation when goals aren't being met. Modify your video length, content, or video placement on, on your site when users aren't engaging the way you'd expect. And finally, make adjustments and experiment to continually improve conversion opportunities. Setting up goals in Google Analytics is a really easy and free way to keep track of how your organizational goals are performing. The first step, of course, is setting them up. In my experience, the most useful goal types are destination and event, because duration and pages per session can vary greatly depending on what you want the user to do on any given page. Once you determine what type of goal you want to set up, specify the details. If you're not sure what the exact dollar amount is for revenue driving goals, use $1. Where applicable, include a funnel or desired page sequence to determine where users might be dropping off. Once goals are set up, you can apply them to many of the reports within Google Analytics. For example, applying goals to a source medium report makes it super easy to see what channels are most effective for goal completion and can help evaluate things like the effectiveness of campaigns. If you expected paid traffic to be higher, reevaluate the user experience for paid traffic. Are you directing them to the most effective page? Are you targeting the most effective audience? The reverse goal path report can tell you what pages led up to a goal completion. This is a great way to measure the effectiveness of your pages and gives you some insight into what path users generally take before completing a goal. Now let's talk about the concept of negative goals. For you Stranger Things fans out there, this might feel a little bit like we're in the upside down, but we'll go through some examples to illustrate how negative goals can be valuable. Here are some examples. First, set up a destination goal to track 404 error pages. In small numbers, 404s are not a huge deal. However, if you have just completed a redesign or changed your information architecture, and you start to see these increase at an alarming rate, you could have a full-blown monster on your hands. You can then use the reverse goal path to find out where the error exists. Site search. Set a, de a destination goal to track site search usage. Again, in small numbers, search usage is totally fine. However, if this starts to ramp up, investigate why. Feedback buttons. Include an event goal to track clicks on feedback buttons. This can help bring attention to any negative feedback so that it can be addressed quickly. In summary, 
When using goals, you will want to determine your site objectives and set up the goals to track their performance, direct people to pages that drive conversions, determine which traffic sources drive the most goal completions, and make any adjustments that will help lower your negative goals. Another great tool used to analyze user experience is heat and scroll mapping. Kind of like an x-ray, heat and scroll mapping give, gives an inside view of what's going on during a user's visit. Are they clicking on expected touch points or are clicks showing up where you didn't expect them? Think of mapping as a de desire pass we talked about earlier. The image on the left shows a scroll map on Olmstead Medical Center's main convenience care page. Scroll mapping shows how far down on a page a user will scroll before losing interest. The area between the red bars is considered the sweet spot and where you want to put the most important information or calls to action. The image on the right shows where users are actually clicking on the page. Olmstead offers a few different options under the convenience care umbrella, including fast care, acute care, and e-care. From this heat map, we were able to determine that many users were clicking on an an embedded PDF within the page's sweet spot to determine what level of convenience care they actually needed. Not only was it not the best user experience, but they were also missing out on a lot of valuable keywords from an SEO perspective. Based on this finding, we recommended that the information in the PDF be pulled onto the page for easier access and improved user experience. We also noticed a number of clicks on the check wait times link at the bottom of the page. Considering only half of the users actually make it to this point on the page, we saw an opportunity for increased conversions by adjusting the placement of the link. So to recap, heat and scroll mapping offer a unique opportunity to actually get inside a user's visit. Take this opportunity to see how users are interacting with features on your site, then test ways to improve user experience by moving content on your page, adjusting copy, or creating new content to lead users to the actions you want them to take. So we've talked about a lot of different tools and metrics you can use to evaluate and measure user experience, but do you really know what you're looking for, what you plan to do with the information, or how you're possibly going to fit it into your already busy schedule? Rest assured, there are ways to make measurement manageable. Before you spend time digging randomly, have a plan in place. Set business goals for the page. Ask yourself, what is the initiative trying to accomplish? Know what the purpose or objective of the page is. Determine what your key performance indicators are so you can see how you're performing against your objectives. And finally, determine metric goals and parameters. Assuming bounce rate is a KPI for your homepage, are you going to worry about it at 10%? How about 50%? How high is too high? Set parameters so you know what you're looking for. When you know what your boundaries are, you'll know when and if you fall outside of them. The next step in making measurement manageable is the use of personalized reports and, and customization. There's a crazy amount of data in GA. Wading through the data to get what you really want can be overwhelming. Customization is a way to whittle down the data to the information you're truly interested in. Located in the menu under customization, you'll find the tools to create custom dashboards, reports, and alerts. Dashboards are a great way to present the data that's most important to you in a visually appealing way. Instead of trying to aggregate data from several different reports and analytics, dashboards will allow you to pull the, to pull the data together in one bird's eye view. And if you typically monitor the same set of standard reports or metrics in GA, dashboards can eliminate a lot of repeat data pulls. Set up the dashboard once and simply change the date range at any time uh, you want to relook at the data. You can also share dashboards with stakeholders so everyone can stay in the loop. Like a dashboard, custom reports also pull together the data that's most important to you. The advantage reports have over dashboards is that they're interactive. By layering dimensions, you can quickly dig deeper into the data that may be raising red flags. This sample report was set up to focus on landing pages and only the metrics I want to see in regard to landing pages. I've also layered the report with source and keyword data. If I want to dig deeper into a specific page, I simply click on the page to see the traffic sources sending users to the page and click on the source to see the specific keywords that contributed to that traffic. 
If, if you prefer a more personalized report, we've also been working with several clients recently to build customized reports in Data Studio. These personalized reports have been very well received because they not only pull in your most valued data in an easy to read way, but they're personalized with your organization's logo and primary colors. They're also created to easily filter data by device type and date range, allowing even more flexibility for the user. A shareable link to these real-time reports keeps you and your stakeholders up to date at any given moment. This particular report included separate pages for KPIs, demographic breakdown, traffic analysis, campaign data, conversion data, top pages, and service line traffic, and so on. We also included a glossary of terms for stakeholders they may, that might not be as familiar with the digital analytics side of business. Again, all this information is included in GA and other sources that are currently available to you, but by pulling the data together in an easily digestible way, we are providing a much more manage manageable way to analyze your data, and stakeholders are a lot more likely to engage with data if they're not overwhelmed by it. So there are a lot of ways to make data manageable, but realistically, most people still aren't going to review the reports every day, maybe once a week, once every couple of weeks. Whatever the frequency level is, you aren't going to realize a problem exists until you see the data, unless you have custom alerts set up. Located under customization in Google Analytics, custom alerts are there to inform you when things have gone wrong. We discussed earlier the importance of setting goal parameters. Once you've determined those parameters, set up goal custom alerts so you're notified immediately when those boundaries have been breached. The faster you're aware of a problem, the faster you can fix it. Experiment. This is the exciting part. Once you've identified an issue, it's time to experiment with making some changes to see if they correct the issue. Whether you are adjusting content, CTAs, or even redesigning the whole site, it's important to keep in mind the measurement component as you experiment. How are you going to measure success? Keeping that plan in mind will help keep your experiments laser focused. One tool we are super excited to start using is Google Optimize. This is a free tool offered by Google that allows you to test changes on your site quickly and easily. We recommend that you always start with a clear hypothesis. For example, changing the copy on the Contact Us form button will drive more form submissions. The ability to test with this interface is extremely easy. The best part is that the results flow directly into Google Analytics, so you can take a deep dive on how each of the variants is performing. Once you get a clear winner, you can confidently make changes or keep the control. And then you're done, right? Not so fast. Maintaining a website is a continuous process of measuring, experimenting, and repeating. As user behaviors change over time, your site should be able to keep up and balance the user's needs with your organization's needs. Hopefully we've shown you a little bit about how your data can help you do that. Okay, so we're going to move into the questions portion now of the webinar. So if you had questions for Lauren and Tracy, please uh, feel free to jot those down into the Q&A box in the GoToWebinar platform. Um, looks like we have a couple here, so we'll get started with this one. It's, if I'm going into a redesign, what is the one tool you'd recommend using? Um, so out of everything you mentioned, what's the number one thing to review before you go into a redesign. I can take that one. Uh, that's a tough question, question because there are so many important things to consider going into a redesign. While not necessarily a tool, I think one of the most important things to consider in any redesign or any uh, page creation or update is what's the purpose of the page. Keeping that one simple question in mind throughout the redesign will help drive many of your or other decisions, as well as help you determine the tools used to measure the success of your redesign. Yeah, I would agree. I think keeping the user in mind at all times is going to be really key in a redesign, um, especially evaluating who your audience is, what information you're trying to give them at each stage. It's probably the best thing you can do. Um, so I think really creating a measurement plan early in the process uh, will also help keep the redesign really focused um, on your business goals. 
Great, thank you. So um, it looks like there was a little bit of confusion around the heat maps and scroll maps. People are wondering where they could find those in GA. And if I'm not mistaken, those are not in GA. Um, those are those are separate um, pieces of of technology. Um, do you two want to speak to some examples uh, of heat maps and scroll mapping that you could that um, someone might be able to use? Absolutely. That is, uh, like you said, that is a separate tool from Google Analytics, but we are able to put uh, tagging on your site so we can track any of the pages on your site. Uh, there's different things you can look at using heat and scroll mapping. As we saw in the uh, presentation, uh, scroll mapping shows how far down on a page the user uh, scrolls before losing interest and where the hot spots are on your page. Uh, there's also uh, click mapping, which we also showed where uh, people are actually clicking on the page so you can look at different elements that are are or are not getting engagement. And there's also, uh, the, those are the two big ones. Those are the ones I probably primarily focus on. And it does give us a big opportunity to determine where changes need to be made. Um, yeah, did you wanna mention I don't know, did you mention a couple examples in there by name or? Like what the heat mapping tool is called? Yeah, the heat mapping tool that you guys use. The heat mapping tool that we generally use here at Geonetric is called Crazy Egg. Uh, there are several other tools available, but that's the one that I would say I primarily use. It's also offering uh, recording now as well, so you can record users as they navigate through your pages, which also provides a lot of valuable insight. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. So we had a question from Deborah. Um, she's wondering if you can discuss the flow view in GA. Oh, the flow view. That is my least favorite report in GA, but um, it also provides the most insight, I feel, into what users are actually doing. Um, so this is super useful, especially um, you know if you're looking at a landing page, especially for campaigns, to see what people are actually doing once they get there. Um, so within that big web of things, it's it takes a little bit of time and effort, um, but you can start to see patterns where people are going. So you'll see kind of the most common next pages, which is a good indicator if that page is useful or not. Um, and then as it extends out, I think it gives you up to like 12 pages in a user flow um, as users navigate through your site. So you can kind of see if users are hopping back before, back and forth between different things, if they're getting lost, if they're just kind of getting muddled. Um, so I think that that behavior flow report is, is useful, it's just visually a little terrifying. Another tool in GA that I like to use, uh, kind of in regards to uh, navigation or behavior flow, if you're looking at the all pages uh, report, right above the graph, there's, the, uh, there's a button to switch from the Explorer view to a navigation summary. And when you're in that navigation summary, you can actually uh, filter down to a specific page and it will show you the previous page path as well as the next page path. So I find that, that to me, that's almost easier to use than the behavior flow report. I agree with you on that. Yeah. All right, we had, um, Warren had a question and um, he was confused a little bit by the assigning a dollar value for conversion goals. And um, so he said, if you don't have an actual value for achieving a goal, should you really be assigning dollar values? Won't that confuse executives looking at reports? I think in that case, it's more of, a, I don't know that that's something that you would necessarily hand over to an executive, especially in terms of dollars. But I think it's a really good balance. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. So, uh, for example, if somebody completes a um, an appointment request for something like cardiology, you know that that's going to be a higher value patient visit uh, dollar wise than, say, like an urgent care. Um, so I think in that sense, you can kind of work with your team to assign just some, not necessarily arbitrary, but you can just assign some sort of like point value. Um, and I think that that's when those values really become helpful because they kind of help, uh, they kind of help prioritize some of these efforts and goals, if that makes sense. And Warren, if I can take a minute to just plug for um, a white paper that we recently released um, 
actually it might be a blog post. If you go check the ideas section of geometric.com, there is a post there on um, how to align your organizational strategy with your digital strategy. And so that's got some tips and kind of some pointers there on how to have those conversations um, with, with executives and with the C-suite on sort of assigning those dollar values to some of the marketing efforts. So you might want to check that one out. Um, also had a question, uh, Erica was wondering, I'm not sure that we can answer this right um, off the top of our heads, but she had questions on the cost for heat maps and scroll maps, um, or if you know of any free tools out there. I'm probably not the best one to talk to, uh, talk about the cost of the service. Uh, it really kind of depends on how many different pages we're placing heat mapping on. Um, and how many different elements you want to look at. So it's really going to vary uh, depend, to, <clears throat> depending on the size of the project. Uh, as far as free tools, boy, I, I don't know. I can't think of any, I can't think of any off the top of my head if they exist or not. This is, like I said, the, the tools that we primarily use are Crazy Egg and we, we sometimes use Hotjar as well, which are both, which are both uh, paid tools. Yeah, and Crazy Egg is like is subscription based, and it kind of allows you a certain number of pages to be monitoring at any given time. So um, that's you know that's been super handy for us as we've you know we finish up one project and then we can kind of swap those out for for a new one. So that's been pretty manageable. So we've got a couple more questions here. Um, so if you're if you're sitting on a question, make sure you enter that in the Q and A now. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up after these next couple. But um, someone was wondering about key search terms to look for to help those lifeline users that you mentioned. So I wasn't sure if there were things that you look at um, specifically that lets you identify. Okay, this this is a lifeline user. Yeah, for sure. Um, so as we look at that search terms report, if we start to see things like like major service line terms pop up, uh, we start to investigate why. Like, is that term not present in your A to Z search? Are users in your area starting to search for the term heart more often than cardiology and your site is all branded cardiology? Um, so those are really helpful just in terms of kind of what people are struggling to find but it also can kind of help inform your keyword research and potentially spur a change in how your website refers to some of these services. Um, and additionally, taking a look at what pages these terms are searched from uh, can be really helpful. This can help distinguish between our lifeline users and our power users. So like you'll notice if somebody's on your homepage searching for a service line, they may not have even attempted to navigate to find it. Whereas if they are on like your services search page and they've maybe clicked through a couple pages and they're still searching for that service line term, um, then clearly they weren't able to find it for whatever reason. Okay, had a question here. Um, similar, so since we're on the topic of um, site search, uh, someone was asking, let me see if I understand it. So they are wondering what some of the best ways to customize your site search can be. And um, I think the, maybe where we want to focus is they're asking about whether or not showing PDFs or Word documents in a site search is a good or bad experience. I don't know if you guys have, if you feel strongly one way or the other on that, or if that's not right within your wheelhouse, we can always tackle that later too with you. We can follow up individually. Yeah, I think it just in terms of uh, I guess it depends on what the content would be in some of these PDFs. I know um, just making sure that your on-page content certainly is is utilizing those keywords that people are searching for um, and just making sure that your PDFs are named appropriately so that those are able to pop up um, as efficiently as, pop, as possible in search. Okay, and um, so for somebody that's just starting out with GA or they want to um, kind of deepen their skills, are there some resources that you can recommend for them um, or directions you can point them on kind of where to get that beginner knowledge or maybe start to dive into a little bit more of the advanced topics that you guys were talking about today? Yeah. Within GA itself, there are uh, several different help tools. Uh, also, one of the things that I found really helpful, uh, and I explained this to clients as well, Anytime you're looking at a metric or a dimension, if you hover over that, 
metric or dimension, it, it typically will give you a, a description of what it is. And th that's right there, it's very handy and it's, it's very descriptive. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're trying to become more proficient and kind of, you know, really dig in and use this on a, a more sophisticated level, I really am a big believer in Google's support videos. Like the, their training videos are actually pretty great. Um, they do a pretty good job of not making it super dry. They give good examples. They have kind of um, like in in video quizzes and things to kind of test your knowledge. And I think that those were really helpful, definitely starting out. Um, and then I think from there, it's really just kind of sometimes you just stumble upon stuff. And so it's really just utilizing it. All right, we'll, we'll wrap things up with this last question here. Um, Katie is wondering about segmenting user traffic and running isolated reports. So um, sounds like they're wondering, you know, is it work, do you recommend segmenting based on employees versus power users versus lifeline users? Or um, is that kind of getting too in the weeds? Yeah, we use segments all the time. I think segments are an incredibly useful tool or incredibly useful feature within Google Analytics to really narrow down into some of these users that you're uh, interested in or concerned about. Um, so for example, you could create a segment where at some point during a user's session, they've used site search, and then you can see like where did they land, where did they come from, did they come from search, from a campaign, um, what, what keywords were they searching for. So I think that segments are really powerful um, in, in many avenues. So I would, yeah, I would definitely recommend using them if you feel comfortable creating them.